All right, so I'm here with Mary Rising, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, right now what we're talking about is, uh, I guess what I'd like to call a zero waste life. Mm -hmm. But what you've managed to do, which I think is really neat and a lot of people can benefit from, is figuring out how to essentially just live waste free. Mm -hmm. And I think especially in America, that's not a concept that we entertain that often. Mm -mm. And one thing that's just kind of important to me is that, you know, there are a lot of different aspects of our lives that we can take responsibility for. Right. Um, right now, it's more along the social justice end mm -hmm. and the, the political end, I guess. But then mm -hmm. if you take a step back, there's also a way to honor the environment around us. Right. And you've taken the time to accomplish that. So, yeah. uh, you know, thank you for coming on. Of and course. Um, I just want to give you a chance to kind of tell your story about, you know, how you got here. What was mm -hmm. the steps you took to get here? And, mm -hmm. you know, just wherever you'd like to start. For sure. Well, I think you gave me a good, good little intro there as a starting point. Um, I think that when we talk about zero waste uh, movements and when we talk about really just environmental movements in general, we don't often see the overlap that they have with social justice and with mm -hmm. race, mm -hmm. but indeed there's like a ton of overlap between the two movements. So um, specifically, whenever you're thinking about the zero waste movement, um, we know that environmental degradation, specifically when we think about like toxic dump sites, when we think about the places where toxic materials and plastics are manufactured, those are predominantly located in communities of color. Mm. So when we are talking about zero waste, like I would like, I would love to see the world change um, the framework that we put environmental work into and and transform that into one of social justice as well because um the actions that we take every day the the products that we choose to buy um those choices have a detrimental impact specifically on low-income communities and communities of color um so when we are thinking about the ways that we can reduce the amount of, of plastic that we consume or even the amount of waste that we produce in general mm. um that really is a, a conversation that has roots in social justice and that yeah. deeply impacts communities of color so um, i'm glad that you you brought that up just right from the jump because i'd, I'd like to honor that throughout the whole conversation of just recognizing that um while zero waste has become kind of a, a white affluent activity, I feel like, and, and a lot of the influencers that we see that do zero waste are predominantly white women even, um, mm -hmm. that we're doing it for for communities of color, for low-income people, and for the people who have been bearing the brunt of environmental degradation for, you know, centuries. Like, yeah. um, I just recently learned about, and this is something I should have been more hip to in the past, but um, specifically, like, in Louisiana, there's a a stretch called Cancer Alley. And it's 85 miles of land between um, New Orleans and Baton Rouge. And there's over like 200 different um, photochemical plants there. So they make plastics essentially, um, all within this one stretch. And predominantly the people that live in that area are low income communities of color. And for a black person that lives in that 85 mile stretch on cancer alley, they're 50 times more likely to get cancer in their lifetime than just your average regular American. And so like, these are the kind of terrifying, horrifying impacts of our environmental decisions that we don't see. Right. But yeah. that have really tangible, really visceral impacts on, on human beings. Wow. So this uh, clearly isn't a hobby for you. It's right. not just something you got into. Like right. this is a deep passion. Yeah, for sure. Um, wow. yeah. And I, and I, and I think that it's important for individuals who do come into it as a hobby to recognize that, right. That there's mm -hmm. like a much deeper history and there's a much deeper, uh, impact than even what we at surface level see because i think a lot of times the movement has been framed as like save the sea turtles like plastic straws are killing the sea turtles right, and right. and that's true and like yeah. we should care about wildlife and we should care about our planet and the environment and the oceans and everything mm -hmm. um but there is a huge people aspect of the movement as well that often goes undiscussed and that i like to bring to the forefront when we're talking about why yeah. you should get involved with zero waste you know yeah. it's it's more than just decreasing your waste it's about making sure that people can survive and live and thrive in their communities yeah um so yeah so with this knowledge of you know taking steps to get to a zero waste life um mm -hmm. obviously putting the knowledge out there of the mm -hmm. how to's and all that right. is you know what you're what we're both wanting to accomplish sure. here 
But uh, speaking of communities of color where they're living in places that obviously like just what you said, mm-hmm. the, they're ending up in places that are just full of waste and right. bad chemicals. Do you believe that the zero waste life that we should all strive to achieve is accessible to those mm. communities as well because it'd be one thing to put this out there right. and say here's how you do it but then to be in like a food desert or yep. something and say well I don't even have the opportunity to mm-hmm. try that you know that is yeah that's an incredible point and one that I I try to center as well is just zero waste is it's a it's a privilege to be able to live a zero waste lifestyle Mm -hmm. i mean you have to have the education to know that it's even a problem because the way that we're raised like we don't really think about the amount of trash that we make we don't think that it's a problem um so you have to have the education to even recognize that it's a problem um you have to have financial resources because a lot of times you're spending a little bit more money specifically on the front end in order to modify um your daily living so that it can fit a zero waste lifestyle um and then you also have to have access to physical spaces that allow you to do that so like grocery stores that have bulk sections where you can bring your own Uh, containers and fill up with bulk or like zero packaging stores which are pretty niche in general Um, and yeah when we're talking about the communities that are the most impacted by environmental degradation those are typically the communities that don't have access to the resources that you would need to live a zero waste lifestyle Mm -hmm. and um, and what's what's really crazy to me to think about is just that um, when you think about our ancestors and and specifically the ancestors of people of color, Mm -hmm. um, living frugally and living zero waste was, was what you did to survive. Like I came from a a rural agricultural family, um, and growing up, you know, my mom was always like, you know, my parents, we never wasted anything. And the products that we bought were built to last. And like now everything's just built to be thrown away. And so like the way of life for so long was about using everything to its fullest capacity and and wasting nothing because that was a way of surviving. And what's happened now is we've come into this system that, that sustainability and living, living frugally like that has almost been co-opted in a way and sold back to us. So now instead of just having, you know, just having it built into our everyday lives that, that we should live a zero waste life, we have to spend money and find places where we can actually make that dream a reality. It's not just the way of life anymore. Right. So in so many ways, the ability to live environmentally friendlier to live sustainably has been taken away from communities, specifically poor communities and communities of colors, Mm -hmm. and then just co-opted and sold back to, to the affluent white upper class. Right. Like, I wonder where, I don't know if you'd happen to know this, but was there a place in history where there was a change? Mm -hmm. Is it, is that something that you've looked into? A little bit. I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert at this at all, but, um, so I mean, like I know plastic in general wasn't invented until like 1907. Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't until really world war two that we started seeing like mass production, Mm -hmm. um, of plastic and other, um, disposable products. Um, so I would say like the mid early to mid 1900s is probably where we saw the boom in, in just the idea that everything we buy comes packaged in trash, right? Like everything you buy at the grocery store comes in something you're going to throw away. Um, so yeah, so I would say it's, it's a really relatively recent phenomenon that, that we produce this much waste and that we create so many things just simply to be thrown away. Um, which is why, which is why it's so mind boggling to me that it, it seems so impossible at this point, you know, in 2020, it seems so impossible to think that I could live for a year and create, you know, one trash bag worth of trash for the whole year. Um, when in reality, our great grandparents and our great, great grandparents were doing that, you know, a hundred years ago. That was, that was something that was just naturally expected. And just to like what you said earlier about, buying things that just break Mm -hmm. and like our grandparents buying things that last right my parents bought a new dishwasher three years ago and it has not consistently been able to work for Mm -hmm. six months straight yeah like it breaks every time and then i go to my grandparents and i see this just crummy looking 1970s mm-hmm. dishwasher that they've never had an issue with yep. to this day. Yep. And it's like that my grandmother who just is also a nonstop human being mm-hmm. runs that thing 
three times a day. Right. And it's just, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. So mm-hmm. I'm like, what, what are we doing? Like, where's the, are we purposely mm-hmm. like jipping ourselves or mm-hmm. is there like something that's, I don't know, but that's, that's something that I've myself. And I think a lot of people For sure. in our generation have noticed. Yeah. Um, so to kind of hone it in though, on your personal testimony, mm-hmm. um, can you kind of give me a rundown of how you're doing a zero waste life just from, you know, morning to night and everything? Sure. Yeah. So, um, just to preface everything, I don't think there's anyone out there that can live a fully zero waste life, right? Yeah. Like it's about minimizing, but I don't know that we'll ever get to a point where we're not making any trash. So, mm-hmm. and I'm still making a lot of changes in my life, um, that, that will change my, my waste output in general. Um, mm-hmm. But so, yeah, so I kind of break it down into, into different areas in, in the house. So like you've got your bathroom mm-hmm. In the bathroom, I use a bamboo toothbrush, which I compost when it's done. Um, as far as toothpaste goes, I use, um, toothpaste from a company called bite. They make uh, little toothpaste tablets that come in a glass jar. Um, and so, yeah, it's pretty funny. You have to crunch on them and then they turn into a powder. And then when you put your wet toothbrush on them, they turn into a paste. Wow. Um, but so what they do is they send you your first, uh, glass jar full of bites. And then when you need a refill, they send you just a refill of the tablets in a compostable mailer. So wow. all you do is dump the tablets into the glass jar, compost the mailer, no toothpaste, no toothpaste tubes, which right. is, which is huge because we go through toothpaste like so quickly. Yeah. And those tubes, Lord knows where those end up. Right. You can't recycle those because yeah. they've got so much junk on the inside of them. But this, um, hold on this bamboo toothbrush though. Yeah. You just immediately <laughs> took me on a left turn right there. What does this thing look like? Because I'm picturing a bamboo shoot, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, no, not quite a bamboo shoot. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's just imagine a, a plastic toothbrush, but make everything wood instead okay. of plastic. So okay. it's just like a wooden toothbrush, okay. um, with wooden, well, I guess bamboo bristles, bristles which the just, bristles are made of bamboo. Yeah. Okay, just cool. seem the same as how long do those last you? Uh, I, I wear mine out. I mean, yeah. I've had mine for like two months probably, and okay, it's still going sweet. strong. It's just like a regular toothbrush, but you, uh, just That's throw it the, in the compost when you're okay, done. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, so you got that when you're, when you're doing your shower in the morning, uh, I use shampoo and conditioner bars that come package free. So it's just a solid version of shampoo and conditioner. Um, as far as shaving needs, like I use a a stainless steel razor instead of disposable plastic ones, which is a one-time switch that you can make and you'll be zero waste from, from then on out with shaving needs. Um, and then yeah, body wash soap bars. You gotta get, you gotta go Seriously. back to the, back to the old school basics, right? Like yeah. you don't need the plastic containers of body wash. Just get a package free soap bar. I use the, uh, Dr. Squatch soap bars right mm-hmm. now and they come in a, uh, they come in a paper package that you nice. can recycle and yep. everything, but their ingredients are all natural. And right. as a guy, like I've never really been pushed super hard for hygiene, right. but then it kind of <laughs> gets me giddy that it's like all these different flavors like pine tar or bay rum or something right. like that. But that's like, that's been my first step to like a, a, a zero waste life. But mm-hmm. that's cool though. Just literally simply starting in the bathroom. Like you, I seriously just thought of like when you said zero waste the first thing that i think of is like the kitchen yeah and like all the food that you can buy and like that's how probably you don't the hardest pre- area pad. yeah mm-hmm. but then it's like i never even thought about the bathroom being right. a place where you waste things yep and lo and behold that's the case right and and those are again really easy one-time switches that you can make you know you buy mm-hmm. a pack of bamboo toothbrushes you buy a reusable razor yeah. and you start buying things package free as Before bars. you know it, you're, you've got a trash can in there. That right. That's empty. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of like easy one-time switches also for women, period products are super wasteful. Um, yeah. I haven't bought period products in like over a year. Hmm. Um, so they make cups that are reusable that you can use. And then they also make just period underwear yeah. that you just wash and it's just like a regular pair of underwear. Um, so, so yeah, there's all kinds of, um, different products that are available. And I would say that that's one cool thing that's come with, uh, the zero waste movement gaining momentum is that people are getting creative about the products that they, they create to solve problems yeah. and to do it in a zero waste fashion. Mm-hmm. Um, and with that being said, I also encourage people though, when you're looking into buying new products that are zero waste, like look into the company's, 
uh, just like ethically how they produce their items. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's a lot of companies too that, you know, will ride the, ride the fad and just, you know, sell it, sell you things saying it's zero waste, but still exploit their workers or still use plastic in the production of it. And, um, so just make sure that, yeah, when you're, when you're transitioning into the lifestyle that you're, you're checking out the companies that you're buying from. And that's been one thing that I've been paying attention to a lot more lately is like, the the companies that we all kind of know and love mm-hmm. and like we've put our trust in because they they're I don't know like we've just we we incorporate their style into our culture a lot right. and then like what you'll find is like the hypocrisy of like sweatshops or mm-hmm. whatever the like you hear about these uh, factories with Apple in China where they've got nets on the outside of the buildings yeah and it's just like you know. I I want to like that's such a bed and nails situation for mm-hmm. me. Like I don't even know where to start with that right. because you want to just say, well, let's end it, and then mm-hmm. it's like, well, well, how do you end that? You're using Apple products every. Exactly. I'm literally recording this podcast right. on an Apple computer, mm-hmm. and then I'm using this to spread awareness about how people are building these yep. items that we're using to spread awareness that they're they're dying for yeah yeah i i feel i feel disgusting from time to time mm-hmm. you know and it, and it's like it's such a really heavy thing and it's just that that right there has been the subject of discussion at a lot of like dinner tables with mm-hmm. my family and stuff because you know sometimes we'll have like a like times where we'll just talk about what we're grateful for right and then other times we'll talk about all the craziness going on in the world mm-hmm. And then you really just, when you take time to, to realize how much it actually hits home for you right? because you're using an iPhone that Lord knows like who the person was that built that mm-hmm. and what their life circumstances were. Right. At, it's, I think, you know, more than just a zero waste life. I think what, what you're on the cusp on as a lot of people are getting into is saying like, Hey, there, there's truly an honest way to live. Yes. And the education for it is needed the most, but then this, you know, this push for accessibility and this push for, you know, saying, Hey, spend a few extra dollars to do the right thing. Right. I think you're very much at the cusp of that. Yeah. Um, that's cool to see, but so moving from the bathroom to the kitchen though, mm-hmm. yeah. um, what, that seems like the, the hardest one to it's tackle. A beast. How have you, have you managed to tackle It's a that? beast. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the easiest first steps I could re- recommend for someone who's just getting into zero wasting is bring your own bags to the grocery store. Like that will save in itself so much plastic. Mm-hmm. Um, so bring your own bags to the grocery store. Um, in the kitchen instead of buying i haven't bought ziploc bags in years um they have reusable um like silicon bags that you can buy that look like ziplocs but Mm -hmm. they're heavy duty and you wash them and reuse them Mm -hmm. um so you know buying buying food storage that's not a one-time throwaway Mm -hmm. food storage um so investing in in different glass food storage containers um upcycling glass jars that you buy products in to store Mm -hmm. food in um that will all help a ton. But then in terms of the grocery store, and this is this is where I struggle the most um, mm-hmm. with zero waste is just shopping at the grocery store. Um, but really what I've done is, is my grocery sh- trips now are like uh, produce heavy. So yeah. most of the items I get are produce, mm-hmm. um, which is really the one area in the store where things don't come already packaged in plastic. Um, So I bring my own reusable um, produce bags and then fill those with produce. Um, That's the bulk of my shopping. And then as far as other items go at like the deli counters, um, I'll try to bring my own containers and some grocery stores don't aren't down with that for i guess health reasons i don't know um but some stores are cool with that and so you just ask them to cut you off however much cheese or meat or whatever you need and then they can just drop it straight into your own container Mm. um and then in terms of dry goods and and the items that you typically find in like the interior of the store um really my method with that is just try to buy items in glass as much as possible Mm -hmm. or aluminum and just try to avoid plastic at all costs. So 
an important thing that kind of guides my zero waste mentality is, is thinking about systems of recycling in the country, right? which are a wildly ineffective and just not great as they currently exist. Really? Yeah. Um, so much of our recycling doesn't actually get recycled. It just gets sent to landfill. So like our standard recycling bin, like that green tub that mm -hmm. we all put out there, right? that's that's not really doing what we think it is. Right. Because the thing is, is even if a city runs a recycling program, they still have to have demand from a, a customer for those resources. The city itself isn't going to use recycled plastic for anything necessarily. They have to have companies that want to buy back those products so that they can make new products out of the old materials. So then we need to, I guess, individually contract recycling companies or something is that a thing or? um i don't know if that's a thing honestly but it's more so just about uh businesses who are creating goods need to start thinking about ways that they can use recycled material to create those goods maybe like there has to be a that, demand from somewhere maybe there's a way that like we can return those recyclable things to the companies that we bought them from right and that's a, a big a big push in an environmental policy right now is holding companies accountable for the packaging that they produce um, mm -hmm. and, and telling companies like, hey, you need to figure out how you're going to get back all of the trash that you produce in your packaging and what mm -hmm. you're going to do with that. Like mm -hmm. essentially you need to either modify how you're packaging things so that it can be returned and reused, which mm -hmm. is not uncommon. Like that's a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I studied abroad in Cape Town, South Africa when I was an undergrad and, uh, I heard that's the most beautiful place in the world. It is. It is. Oh um, my gosh. but one of my favorite things ab about being there was when you go out to a bar and you get a, a beer and a glass bottle, you give the bottle back to the bartender at the end of the night and you get a, a deposit back on it, like a 25 cent deposit. Right. But you give it back to them. They fill up crates of these bottles and then they send them back to the beer brewing company where they're sanitized and refilled. Mm. I mean, like, it could be so simple, right? Why Why is it, do you think, that, like, you know, we call ourselves the leaders of the free world, mm -hmm. like the, the United States of mm -hmm. America. Why are we... So oblivious. Why are we not there? Why yeah. are we not there with that? You know, are we just under pressure to be good at everything that mm -hmm. we think is important, like pop culture and basketball? Right. Or, like... <laughs> our military you know <laughs> yeah I, I mean i think it comes down to profit at the end of the day it's cheaper to pump out a bunch of new plastic as opposed to uh creating new systems that bring your products back to you for reuse um and and yeah i think we're just driven by by the money by the profit and profit doesn't necessarily coincide with living intentionally and living yeah. frugally and and living thoughtfully and sustainably um you know, along with that, though, I don't want to completely crap on all of the things we're doing. I did hear recently that we are, uh, like, leading the world in reducing carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. That's, like, one thing that's yeah. been, like, our claim to fame as far as that goes. And then we do have a handful of companies that are really uh, um, making a mission to, like, clean the oceans, mm -hmm. like, for ocean. Yeah. Yep. Have you heard of that? I have, yeah. I'd love to just like get more in touch with like what they're doing and everything. Right. It seems like it's really cool. And then there was this kid. Um, he's been interviewed on a lot of podcasts, but he started a GoFundMe for just like he made this company. But basically, oceanographers and marine biologists all in that community sort mm -hmm. of were aware that the currents in the ocean ran in such a way that a lot of this um, like ocean, natural ocean debris collected together and there was this giant floating island, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And so, yeah, so you're aware of this. And so what's happened now is all the trash in the ocean has collected there too. Mm -hmm. And yep. it's killing millions of marine life that it's was like dependent on that island. like an island of trash, island. yeah. Right. And now he's like inventing something to go out there and get it. Mm -hmm. But it, it, that is fascinating to hear about that. Like if somebody's like, well, I don't really see the evidence or something for like the ocean and the trash and mm -hmm. whatnot. Be like, well, there's literally an Island uh, of, of it. trash. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, you know, like we are like able to observe this in real time now. Right. Right. I think and, that's really interesting. Yeah. And I, I think there's definitely tons of people doing incredible work, um, in terms of trying to make sure that, that we're building a future for future generations that can't, can be sustainable. Um, 
so it's not to not at all to offset you know the work that those individuals are doing but Mm -hmm. um it's also just a call to action for big corporations to start taking responsibility because I feel like so much of the environmental movement and the sustainability movement falls on the shoulders of individuals like Mm -hmm. myself and like you who just want to make small decisions in our life that, you know, slightly impact the amount of waste we might produce. But corporations who are responsible for the bulk of the waste that's being produced, you know, aren't necessarily making those same intentional decisions about right. about the way they produce and the products they produce and things so right um so yeah for everything great that's being done there still needs to be a push for accountability specifically corporate accountability um which grocery or company would you say has made it the easiest for you to to do a zero waste life good question and i'm i'm in st louis so it's probably gonna look look a little different um yeah. but really um we have a local grocery store that that has like they bring in um, products from different farm farmers in the area it's called local harvest um and they have bulk bins um and yeah like local bulk bins which is crazy like super cool um but so they've probably made it the easiest for me i just bring my own bags there and and the thing too about uh grocery chains is that that's typically where i found you run into um like especially right now during coronavirus you run into like they they'll ban reusables because they think it's for some reason like un- unhealthy or something yeah. um and so like it, covid specifically has put me in a really t- tough spot where like i can't bring my own reusable bags into the grocery store i can't bring my reusable produce bags into the grocery store even though and they state this like on on websites that that no proof or evidence has been found that you know COVID can be carried on a on we're, a bag. We're in such a we're in such a mess with the facts of what actually works and doesn't right. work. And and think about even we set ourselves back with um, what I hear restaurants are having to do now, like they have to use. Um, paper menus and dispose them every time they put them on the table and you're just like it's awful you know Mm -hmm. we're like back to square one yep you know and that doesn't that itself like doesn't even make sense like sanitizing the menus can work like if nothing else get plastic laminated menus and you know run them through the dishwasher or or something wipe them down with some hand sanitizer yeah (laughs) yeah it just seems like we're just it, it seems like we are a panicked animal mm-hmm. backed in a corner and we're just biting every hand that right. comes near us because we don't, we don't know what we're doing. Exactly. You know? Yeah. I, I told my family this at my coffee and tea shop that I run. Mm-hmm. Um, I hadn't, I had a bandana and I hadn't, I hadn't pulled it up yet. Mm -hmm. And a guy comes up to me and he's like, you've got a mask. And I turn around and he's got like this cloth bandana on as well. I was like, Oh yeah, I haven't, I didn't put it on yet. And he goes, put that crap on. And like, just, you know, kind of aggressively comes at me and I'm like, like, I get it. There's fear and like, I'll, I'll help you out and stuff. And I said, Hey, look, sir, like, I don't want to. I don't want to make any waves, but you're about 10 yards away from me. We both right. have our mask on. We're I good. think we're fine. He yep. goes, you're retarded. And he said that, and it was like this 70-year-old guy, and I was like... Oh, my gosh. I was like, I did not just get punked by this 70-year-old wow. dude. But you can see like how there's so much change in daily information with all of mm-hmm. what's going on that everything that... Like that guy, what he said was clearly fear-based. Oh, yeah, you know? for sure. And I was like, man, take a step back and just... Just think about like this, this disease is just like influenza, the way mm-hmm. it spreads and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, let's all, let's all calm down. But Take a breath. It, yeah. It definitely hasn't done us any favors in like creating no waste. You yeah. Know? It's been, I, I mean, I don't know how else to say it besides like the paper menus have been kind of the most outrageous thing right. that I've seen. And I'm like. And I mean, uh, even the PPE and the masks that we use that we throw away after we use them, right? Like that that's... also has bothered me yep. as well. The amount of masks. And then, uh, who was it? Four Ocean. Mm-hmm. They posted an Instagram photo of like a handful of masks that they found in the ocean. Yep. And, like... and they're like, here's our next uh, plastic straw problem. It's going to be the yeah. masks. I was next, like, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. But... It is. It's depressing. So going into the kitchen right, right, right. making all those adjustments using glass jars reusable produce bags mm-hmm, mm-hmm. have you changed your diet in any way to kind of cater to a zero waste life yeah so i definitely am, am trying to eat less meat at this point in my life um 
the process of, of raising cattle or other animals uh, as livestock is actually like it requires a ton of like water and energy and everything um, so is that more of a moral thing for you or is it like a it's more a, it's an environmental thing i've been right. a meat eater my whole life yeah. um but but yeah just reading into the the impact that that agriculture and livestock specifically has on the environment mm -hmm. has been just kind of a, a moment where I, you know i i fight i fought it a little bit where i was like i don't want to give up you know steaks and cheeseburgers and whatever but right, right. but it's something that that I'm working on definitely cutting back on in my day-to-day -day life um so yeah I mean and again because produce is the one thing in the grocery store that's not packaged in plastic I've been eating a lot more vegetables which is great mm -hmm. for your health right there um you go. exactly but outside of of that I don't think it's necessarily diet changes but I will say that I've I've learned how to make a lot of things at home that I did not think that you could make like things that I used to buy already made um yeah, yeah. and I think we've been tricked into thinking that a lot of things that are just really easy staples uh, are impossible for us to just to make with a few ingredients at home so like well, it's something that our grandparents could probably easily exactly do. right yeah. and again it goes back to like this is knowledge and this is um you know information that that our grandparents and great-grandparents and our ancestors would have just been born with born into right yeah. like um but that's been taken away from us and and again sold back to us so like mm -hmm. we don't think we can make bread anymore we think we have to buy it from someone and it's like no yep. it's so easy to make bread um it's it's easy to make your own yogurt it's easy to make your own sour cream and different products um and so a lot of my zero waste movement in terms of the kitchen in terms of food has just been learning how to cook again yeah. um and learning how to make things so that i don't have to buy them in plastic yeah um so that's been that's been a really cool and unexpected part of the process that that i've i've stumbled upon in trying to be zero waste it's just i i kind of think i know how to cook now which is cool. which is nice um if you get meat um do you have a particular place that you would get it from? Because there's a there's places like Butcher Box and stuff, mm -hmm. which they do like the grass fed, pasture right. raised, you know. But then it's a hundred and thirty nine dollars for ten pounds yeah. of meat, and I'm just like, Bad. I'm like, hey, I appreciate what y'all are. Doing. Right. I can't afford you, you know. Yeah, and the thing in. I appreciate the subscription boxes like that because they're obviously trying to make sure that people have access to mm -hmm. sustainable products. Right, right. Um, but is that actually accessible when it's 140 bucks for a package, right? Exactly. Not necessarily. Especially and, not in like a food desert or like somebody right, who's in a yeah. low income area. You no. know, it's just... And all of those products come sealed in plastic each individual cut of meat is going to be wrapped in plastic exactly. right so so that's a no-go for me um if i am doing me and this works for several reasons what i found is just finding a local butcher is the mm -hmm. best way to go a because then it's local usually grass-fed you're not seeing a lot of like big uh commercial operations happening you right. know locally um so it's usually like a local pasture raised grass-fed meat but then also uh, unlike like chain grocery stores where again they have that fear about bringing in your own containers um, when you just go to the butcher and you develop a relationship with your your local butcher mm -hmm. he doesn't care if you bring in a container like he's right. gonna give you the meat that you paid for and however you want to take it home you're gonna take yeah. it home yeah. um, so so in a lot of ways uh, shopping locally, shopping small is, is a lot easier when you're trying to transition to zero waste because you're just working with a human who like yeah. understands like, Oh, I appreciate that you're trying to do better for the environment. I'll give you your product and you can bring your own container and I'll let you do that. Um, mm -hmm. and you're building relationships along the way too, which is cool. Like I find a lot more of these local businesses are really kind of giving the government the middle finger here mm -hmm. when it comes to operating their businesses. Yeah. And I, I respect it, you know, to an extent, like I, I think that, you know, we've kind of really, there's obviously we've, we're at a place where we realize we did not take the time to talk about a situation mm -hmm. that could possibly happen because we genuinely believe that it wasn't going to happen. Right. There was another situation uh, that was talked about on TED Talks where this guy literally talked about the the statistical chances of a pandemic happening. And it was like so much so that it was like, how did we not pay attention to this? Mm. And then he said, let me tell you the statistical chances of our grids crashing and falling out where like 
internet just mm. shuts off or like electricity just shuts off and it was higher Ooh. than that and it was like and he goes please for the love of god at the end of this ted talk he goes for the love of god don't just listen to this right <laughs> like, right but it's it's like that in in the the pandemic and this talking about grids crashing you I and my family are very much in a proactive uh, mindset of learning these, mm -hmm. you know, self-sustainable, mm -hmm. homestead, adaptable living where we aren't depending on a supply chain from right. Oklahoma or California mm -hmm. to bring like the essentials that we need. And I think that it's just like, again, it's... I think everybody's starting to realize it and yeah. everybody's getting on board with it. Mm -hmm. One thing that I'm actually wanting to do is not like a community garden, but I want to do like a self-sustained garden in oh, cool. my backyard. Yep. And obviously like I wouldn't know how much land that I would need for one person mm -hmm. or like a family yeah. to like do a rotation of crops and stuff like that. Right. But is that, is that ever something that you've entertained as well? For sure. Unfortunately I live in a, an apartment in the middle of St. Louis. Um, oh, so it, it is not an option for me right now. Um, I mean, I, I grow like small things like herbs and stuff, you know, in the kitchen okay. window. Um, but yeah, I would love, love, love to have my own garden someday and be able to grow some of the food that I have to buy from stores and stuff. And there's mm. plenty of, uh, really cool information online about like, how big of a garden do you need to feed one person for a year? And like, uh, people have really thought this through and really know what they're talking about when it comes to, to gardening and growing food. But yeah. that would be an incredible addition to your zero waste toolkit is, is producing, you know, your own, your own, uh, produce and, and gardening. If you um, had the option to start somewhere, mm -hmm. where would you want to like, what would you want to start with the most? for like zero wasting in general or for gardening i guess for gardening okay. yeah like to to just i don't know there's so many people that are like i want to do heirloom tomatoes oh yeah or like i want to do like squash and i'm like uh, okay well so does everybody else yeah so, you know like what would you see for yourself being the most essential need to start out with right i mean i think you just have to look at your diet what what produce do i eat the most of yeah. like don't grow something if you're not going to eat it right yeah, like i'm not going to eat a lot of heirloom tomatoes so that's not what i would go for but i eat salads every day so like spinach go. and lettuce would probably be a good starting point or like bell peppers onions you know yeah, yeah. um starting with the the staples of your diet and then working out from there i think would be kind of yeah. how i would approach it do you have any uh i guess so you've reached a pretty good point right now do you have any other goals or any uh milestones that mm -hmm. you're trying to achieve to accomplish for sure more yeah. zero waste yeah so um i guess moving forward one of my big thing this is a, it's a small thing but it's a big thing for me because i always forget mm -hmm. is just when i go out to eat bringing my own like tupperware or containers to take home leftovers okay. because i always go out to eat never finish a meal and then have to get like a styrofoam or whatever yeah. you know to go container and it would be so easy to just bring my own and i just always forget so that's just personally something I'm trying to always uh, remember moving okay. forward. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely am, am making a conscious effort this year specifically to start um, buying everything secondhand if at all possible. So mm. as far as like clothing, I'm trying to give up all fast fashion. Uh, I gave myself one last ASOS purchase at the end of last year. And then I was <laughs> like, all right, that's it. Like, you know, we're so not what now then what like Goodwill. Yeah. Or? Thrift stores. Um, wow. And the cool thing about, thrift is well i don't know if it's cool necessarily but there's a lot of people who are getting into the the thrift and vintage game that are like actually curating really cool uh like capsule wardrobes and stuff with thrift with secondhand with vintage clothing um okay. so there's actually definitely a way to still have you know a, like a stylish wardrobe secondhand are you from here originally yeah, I'm from New Albany, New Indiana Albany. originally. Do you know where uh, the vintage banana is? I don't. On Barstown Road? Mm -mm. Okay, look up the vintage banana after okay. this. Okay. You want to talk about, they they go to all of the thrift shops they can, mm. and they find the golden items. And like curate. Nice. Yep. It's, nice. A, it's a real dope store. Yep. But that's cool though. So yeah. even now, like transitioning to secondhand, uh, what did you call it? Secondhand? Thrift, thrift vintage, thrift, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I didn't, that's something that I've never even thought of as well. For yeah. sure. 
I think a, a big part of zero waste that we don't think about is just generally buying less. Yeah. We are such a consumerist society. We are, we are, we get satisfaction from like buying things, right? Like we get the happy, um, happy reaction from, from buying anything. Um, and, oh, it's new and it's yeah, clean. it's new and fancy and exciting. Yeah. And like that gives us just like an adrenaline rush that we, that we look for. Um, and so, and that's created a culture where we feel more attached to items than people sometimes, right? Like we get a, a bigger rush from making a, a purchase of a new laptop than we do from seeing our significant other at the end of, you know, a long work day. Like no doubt it's, it's it's a toxic culture that we've created through consuming so much so in general going zero waste one of the big things that i like to point out to people is it's it's not even simply about reducing your waste it's about reducing your purchases mm -hmm. uh buying less in the first place because uh most of the time the items that we need already exist somewhere and a goodwill somewhere mm -hmm. and have already been made the resources have already been put into making that item and all you have to do is go out and find it and it'll be cheaper anyway right yeah um Every time we buy a new item, we're, we're demanding more from the environment. We're taking another resource from the environment. And, and oftentimes we just don't need to be doing that because yeah. like I said, it already exists somewhere. Um, so yeah, so a big part of zero waste is just buying less in general. And so that's another thing now that zero waste is starting to become a little bit like trendier, I think. And we're seeing a lot of like social media influencers starting to talk about it, um, mm -hmm. specifically in my realm, I guess, uh, cause that's something I'm interested in and follow. But, <laughs> yeah. um, but now that it's becoming trendier and now that companies are picking up on the fact that people want to go zero waste, there's a lot of people that are creating items and selling items that we don't necessarily need to, mm -hmm. to be zero waste, but they're marketing it as zero waste. So we buy it anyway. Yeah. So, so do you, uh, I think along with what you just said, you want to sit in on the podcast? The fiance just arrived, so <laughs> yeah, pull up a chair. Can you edit that part out? <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Laura just showed up, so she's gonna want to hop in on the podcast. But um, the next question I wanted to ask you though was about minimalism, since mm -hmm. you just kind of referred to buying less. Do you? Do you have an opinion on minimalism or is that something that you're getting into? For sure. Yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty intimately connected with the zero waste movement. Um, I would not consider myself a minimalist um, mm. because I do still find joy in items, unfortunately. Mm. Um, but but it's definitely something I'm working towards uh, is just consistently reducing the amount of things that I have instead of bringing more into my house. Um, that's been a really, that's been a benefit of COVID is just getting to sit with all of my things and realizing how much I have and then going through it and like donating a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so I think moving towards minimalism is, is an important step. Um, I will also say, so I, I took a year off after college and worked, uh, as an AmeriCorps at a homeless shelter in Little Rock. And while I was there, I worked for their, um, secondhand resale store that they ran. So, um, community members brought in items, donated them, and then we sold them and the proceeds went back to supporting the shelter. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I found while I was there is that even when we get rid of things and we donate them to the Goodwill or to a, to a thrift shop, um, a lot of those things still end up in landfill. So we were still throwing away so much of the stuff that was donated to us just because it, I mean, it was, it was old, it was disgusting. Like yeah. people weren't going to buy it back. And, mm. and so even when we buy something, knowing that in the future we could donate it and it could find a second life, that's not always the case. And yeah. in a lot of things that we think are finding a second life are actually going straight to landfill. Mm. Um, so in that way, like being a minimalist and just, and just drastically cutting back on the amount of things that you own, things that you buy is really important to being zero waste as well. Yeah. So yeah. Wow. Babe, do you want to say hello? Isn't she awesome? <laughs> Isn't she so cool? <laughs> I want to talk. My friend is cool. <laughs> um, now that the real host is here, I oh, have okay, a few sorry. questions. Nice. I'm just kidding. I'm ready. Um, I probably smell really bad because I have baby drool and I let Pilgrim like lick my face. So. Mm. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah um, great. <laughs> um, well, just well, to I, update you, we've talked about pretty much everything we've talked about pretty much everything <laughs> that she's done to create zero waste in her bathroom and in her kitchen. And then we've even talked about, you know, how a lot of these 
like landfills and just less than desirable environments are located really close to communities of people of color. So a lot of these food deserts or landfills or what was the Cancer Just, Alley? Yeah, yeah. Cancer Alley was a place that she talked about, which is a strip in Louisiana that's about 85 miles long where all of these plastic companies develop these materials. Produce. Produce mm -hmm, yeah. with really harsh materials. And then that environment is saturated and a lot of communities of color live in those environments. So we've, we've gone over quite a bit and mm -hmm. I do have like one or two more questions left but I didn't know you know babe if you wanted to if you had anything that you had kind of thought about to put out there well, you totally can you can ask questions but first of all I just like I've only obviously heard like 15 seconds of the conversation <laughs> but yeah. I think you're just an amazing person to have on the podcast because you. you are like um like an encyclopedia of like what people need to know <laughs> and like just you're just really smart and you've always been really smart Thank and you. so you kind of like whatever like socioeconomic area that you're in or geographical area you learn it from the inside out and you're mm -hmm. like okay here are like just practical ways that we can enhance this community mm -hmm. like it doesn't matter who you are this is what you can do right and so I love that about you because I feel like in a way you're kind of like a warrior for whatever place you're in because you're literally giving people the tools of what every single person can do, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so you don't need to be like a super equipped person in like A, B, C, D. Like you don't need to be like a super awesome teacher or counselor or whatever. You can literally be who you are and like change where you're living right. just by changing habits. And so... That's so cool. And like, I just, I've always admired like your knowledge for things. And like, I remember when you worked in Little Rock and like mm -hmm. hearing about that homeless shelter and like how I, cause I was like assuming like, oh, it must like help a lot. And you're like, actually here are the areas that it's not helping. Right. And I was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is discouraging. <laughs> so, but it's like, we need to know that stuff right. because like we don't want to just be like slap a label on it like oh yeah goodwill helps let's take it to goodwill right you have to be like, critical of yeah everything <laughs> and you think beyond the line that most people think so you're like okay so we're bringing all these clothes here then what happens mm -hmm. then what happens mm -hmm. then what happens and personally i've never seen a landfill in my life so I'm like, that's not something I think about. Right. And that's, that's something I talk, white privilege, right? Like we've never had, I've never seen a landfill. I've never had to live next to a landfill. I've never had to live next to a plant that manufactures nasty smelling, disgusting, chemically products. Right. And that's just a part of, of the privilege of being an upper class white person. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why we feel so far removed from these things is because we don't experience them. We don't see them. Um, but it is such a reality for so many people that I'll live that. This. I've, I've been to a landfill just cause I've had to, I've had to take some stuff there mm -hmm. and it is just as horrifying as like you think it would be. Yeah. Um, not so much as just like the way everything looks, but like the, um, unavoidable smell that mm -hmm. you're inhaling mm -hmm. and like your lungs and your throat sense it and right. like, like are consistently trying to reject it. And you've got these methane towers everywhere. That's always on <sighs> fire that it's making sure it's burning the methane so that it doesn't collect or like disperse out Ugh. further. Right. And so it, it, that to me, I wish I knew more about the method to the madness of a landfill mm -hmm. because it's like what is a landfill's actual purpose or did we just say we don't know what to do with this trash so we're just going to throw it all here right. and just hope it goes away right or is like be like well the science behind a landfill is mm -hmm. you know if you leave it here long enough like right I, so if if the case is though that we are designating spots in certain places in the world where we dump the the non-perishable almost mm -hmm. like it, it won't decompose right what's gonna happen right and where's it gonna go where does it go what is it gonna do how do we find more space to keep dumping like at some point right 
is there going to be a line where it's like we don't have the space to make these huge landfills anymore? And if and if you, th- I've jotted down some little little uh, stats earlier, but um, worldwide there are 3.5 million tons of trash produced every day. So when you think about just where is that going, and how is that sustainable? Like how how will that last over a long period of time? Yeah. When we're making 3.5 million million tons of trash per day where is that all going and how can we make that last long term how is that a sustainable long-term solution that i wouldn't have an answer i wouldn't know where to begin i swear like sometimes i swear like politicians that act like they know what they're talking about Mm -hmm. i'm like you don't you don't have a clue no it's so much bigger than us it's so much bigger than us yeah so yeah so 3.5 million tons of trash Mm -hmm. So just for reference, because I'm a very visual person. So Mm -hmm. what is like, how can I envision 3.5 million? You said, Mm -hmm. how, what would that? I have absolutely no idea. (laughs) Like how many elephants we talk? A lot, a lot of elephants, Laura, (laughs) like a pack, several packs of elephants. (laughs) So, well, let's see an elephant weighs an average of one ton i believe like oh, about two thousand pounds so there you go so three three hundred and five million elephants. 15 yeah 3.5 million elephants okay how many whales <laughs> i don't know <laughs> what but, were the other but, statistics um, though you had Let's yeah go so ahead, just to, those off. to break that down even more america is obviously one of the biggest producers of trash in the world so mm-hmm. we're making 250 million tons per year uh, and that breaks down to the average American making 4.4 pounds of trash per day. So we, our 150 pound selves, are making four pounds of trash every single day. As I look over in the corner at our <laughs> two trash bags and oh pile of Oh my God, I, totally, I was just like, why didn't we take Mary that Mary was saying that and I was like looking in the corner like, um. Glancing over guiltily. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, but I mean, and that's the, like, we don't think about it because it's so easy. You just throw it out in your can and you move forward with your life, right? But that's 1,600 pounds of trash a year, just myself, I'm making. So for people who say that, you know, zero waste isn't making a difference, I'm putting 1,600 less pounds of trash into the world every year. And if I start that now at 25 and do that for the rest of my life. Yeah. And imagine... Imagine everybody just kind of collectively decides like to get on board mm-hmm. in some way, but it's like, first I need the education. Mm-hmm. I need the access to the education. Right. And then I need the access to the opportunity to mm-hmm. do that. Yep. Um, what I'm literally looking over in the corner and noticing is like half of that one garbage bag on the ground has so much uh, compost in it mm. that that is another thing that I've always been curious to learn about is mm-hmm. like, I'd like to do a compost thing, yeah. but then I, I don't know what I could do with the compost, like outside of just putting it back in my garden if I had one right. or if it could like go to a very, very legitimate fuel source yes, that, that's that a, needs it. That's a huge point I forgot to hit in my kitchen routine is that I've started composting. Mm-hmm. I don't personally compost. Mm-hmm. Um, so in a lot of cities, there are like compost pickup services where mm-hmm. you can send your compost to them and then they'll actually bring you back like soil or dirt or whatever. Um, but I'm super lucky in that through, um, my work as a practicum student while I was getting my MSW, I met, um, my, my supervisor at one of the sites, they have a community garden that they run out of their backyard mm. and they let people bring their compost for free. You don't have, it's like not a charge or anything. You just mm. bring your compost, drop it off at their house, and then they turn it into soil that they use to grow food for the community that they give out for free. So really cool. Just like closed loop cycle of like doing good, um, Um, but that's actually been, I would say probably the biggest area that I've decreased my waste in the kitchen is through food scraps that would normally go into trash, Mm -hmm. specifically produce. You can't put like meat and stuff in compost. That doesn't work. Um, but specifically produce, um, wait, you can't put meat in compost. 
not in like compost that you're using to grow food. There's like commercial composts that like will take anything, I'm pretty sure. But if you're just putting compost into like your garden in the backyard, yeah. no, you just want to do produce, eggshells, wow. cardboard. I um, thought it was like just all biological material almost, but. I'm pretty sure the meat leads to like maggots and nasty bug infestations that you just don't want yeah. in your compost. I can um, see that. But yeah, I'm not a pro. I'm not actually actively composting in my backyard. Um, I give it mm. to someone else who knows how to compost. Sweet. But um, but yeah, that's been huge. I mean, I probably take the compost more often than I take out the trash at this point. I, I'm dropping off compost every week. That's um, awesome. Yeah, and that's been a huge, uh, huge help in my zero waste journey. And that's also something a lot of the zero waste community talks about is just that if food waste itself were its own country, it would be the top producer of methane and greenhouse gases. Um, because when it sits in a landfill, that's what it does is it just creates those gases and it just sits there in those. Um, so food waste is a huge, (coughs) huge thing that needs to be talked about in the zero waste movement. Um, Mm. and just in the environmental movement in general is that we're putting in all these resources into growing food. A lot of it's getting wasted before it even gets purchased it's just mm-hmm. getting thrown out by grocery stores um and then on the back end what we do pr- uh, purchase and what we do consume a lot of that we're throwing back into landfill through like leftovers and scraps and things like that um and that creates an immense amount of greenhouse gases so jeez yeah you got something to say man? yeah one thing that i hate is like the food that's produced that just gets thrown away i hate that and then what happened with covid like i heard drew mm. tell me stories of like things that grocery stores couldn't like take and so farmers were forced to just like harvest it all and then throw it away i hated that so much it's insane um but there so have you heard of wayside in louisville Mm -hmm. it's this homeless shelter oh is that the one you were telling me have you told me about this before maybe probably Mm -hmm. (laughs) so they do like soup kitchens and they house people and like yeah they do a lot so i i'm pretty sure it's like a whole thing so Mm -hmm. um one thing for the soup kitchens, this lady, I don't remember her name and I probably wouldn't mention it if I did because yeah. <laughs> I don't know if what she does is legal because she'll go to like the back of grocery stores mm-hmm. and like basically dumpster, dumpster dive, dive yeah. because they throw away stuff that's like, they can't sell it anymore, but it's technically still okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. So she'll go and like get pastries and stuff. And she's even like made cahoots with the people that work there. And she's like, Hey, before you put this in the dumpster because she knows the days that they throw it out Mm -hmm. so she'll go and get all the pastries that she can and then take it yep to wayside and i hope that's okay to say (laughs) because no one's gotten sick i mean it's like it's stuff that she's kind of like premeditated on like can Mm. i do this obviously she wouldn't get pastries to make people sick exactly but like they don't get wayside doesn't have like this like extravagant budget to give Mm -hmm. them gourmet food or even dessert and so they actually like i've done soup kitchens there and they love it they always ask for dessert they're like what's for dessert Mm -hmm. and sometimes they have it sometimes they don't but when we do it's like stuff that bakeries are getting rid of or kroger yeah places that (laughs) um you know not kroger i don't know why i said that what my grandmother listen my grandmother's the only one that listens to this podcast so she's not gonna call us she's not gonna report us or anything yeah but yeah so the composting the recycling zero waste life like there's all these different facets that if we had the education to, once again, we could actually really make a serious impact mm-hmm. on this environment. Um, I know that the big subject of discussion right now, as far as, you know, the political spectrum mm-hmm. goes, is, you know, climate change. Right. And what the human direct impact, mm-hmm. like the carbon footprint of the human population right. is on it. And that's that's up for debate and stuff like that. And that's a big argument. But I think instead of trying to solve it on a mass uh, systemic level, you've taken it to an individual Mm. self-responsibility level. Mm -hmm. Um, One of my last questions for you that involves, you know, taking personal responsibility, what would be your top five rules or practices that you implement into the zero waste mm-hmm. life? Do you like a top five just sort of go-to system? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, I mean, in, in terms of just like 
the easiest top five things that you could do to reduce waste. I think, um, I think that bringing your own bags to the grocery store is a super easy place to start. Having a reusable water bottle that you take everywhere instead of buying plastic mm-hmm. water bottles, super easy. Um, I think making one-time switches in your bathroom, like we talked about, with mm-hmm. a stainless steel razor um, or the bamboo toothbrushes or the toothpaste bites, um, any of those kind of like one-time switches, period underwear, um, would be a super easy place to start. Um, and then composting, if possible, I think is a really important, really important part of, of reducing waste. Hmm. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, there's different, it depends on, on the level of, of financial ability you have and then access to stores that provide different, uh, methods of purchasing, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but definitely bringing your own bags, shopping bulk at the grocery store, um, doing your one-time switches in the bathroom, composting, reusable water bottles Sweet. would be kind of like the, the easy starting points, I think, for, for moving into doing zero waste. Do you have any resource material or any uh, uh, go-to companies that you automatically turn to for? Yeah, I don't have a ton, honestly, but I do follow one blog pretty thoroughly um (laughs) the zero waste chef um it's this middle-aged woman from i think she's from like canada initially but she lives in california now canadians are so resourceful and i love it i am telling you what um but yeah she essentially she lives a, a completely zero waste life but she specifically in her blog focuses on how you can cook zero waste which like we were talking about is one of the harder places to go zero waste because all of our food comes packaged seriously um so she is she's taught me like how to make bread, how to make yogurt, how to make sour cream, how to make things at home, um, zero waste so that I don't have to buy them at the store. Mm -hmm. And then just also tips about, um, how to, you know, make your produce last longer whenever you're storing it so that you don't waste it as quickly and, um, how to just grocery shop zero waste. Mm -hmm. So she's been a really cool resource that I follow pretty consistently. Um, and it's helped me make a lot of my transitions in the kitchen. So the zero waste, zero waste chef. Um, would be a, a big recommendation. And then, um, actually this is, oh, I forgot to mention this at the beginning of the podcast as well, but this is an incredibly well-timed podcast because July is plastic free July. So they're starting like a month long initiative to try to push living plastic free and transitioning into that. So, um, so I'm encouraging everyone to just start finding small ways to reduce the amount of plastic that you buy, which is a really good starting point for zero waste. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and this is the month to start doing that. It's an Australian organization that started this like movement movement and um so that's happening this month so i encourage everyone to get involved with that and and try to start monitoring your plastic intake and reducing that a little bit that's awesome yeah Yeah. that's awesome that is so cool it's what it's july 3rd yeah it was perfect timing Mm -hmm. so uh, that pretty much covers it for me as far as the questions about Mm -hmm. zero waste life do you have any uh thing you want to add to that (laughs) no (laughs) <laughs> it's just funny when I like grab the mic. Um, I mainly, I don't really have tons of questions always, but I do always have like encouragement, mm-hmm. but, um, I just love one, this podcast because we can have conversations that are so enlightening and like, I just feel like there's such good like community and like, mm-hmm. like fellowship is the word that I'm thinking of, but like any time we can get together and like drink from other people's wisdom mm-hmm. and like just things that they're really good at, like ways that they're really effective and being just like a good person. Like that encourage me, encourages me so much. And I will say, Mary, like ever since I really noticed your journey in this on Instagram, it inspired me so much. And I feel like there are a lot of people that are like, dang, like, I can't believe she's doing that. (laughs) Yeah. Cause it's not like you're like mad and you're using anger and like your voice Mm -hmm. to like, manipulate people into right. doing it you're using your voice and your actions to invite people into it and you're like look this is what i'm doing and i love these things about it here are the benefits of it and so right i really think that you have like such a beautiful soul and there's so many things that i love about this girl people but like we've been best friends since middle school yes <laughs> we go way back yeah and like okay side note sometimes when i Like, you know, I still live by Scribner. Mm -hmm. So when I go running on the track, those tables are still there, like outside where kids can eat lunch and stuff. They're the exact same. And I literally can like point to the table where we all used to sit. And when I would have two lunch trays and everyone else would have (laughs) 
one. I was ridiculously hungry and I don't know why. But um yeah. <laughs> we would eat so much. Oh gosh. Anyways, um yeah, it's just been like a joy to watch you develop like and the ways that you've like invested into people and like you have just taken on this whole journey of like self-sacrifice and Mm. selflessness like you are truly an altruistic person and I'm just like wow I love the way that she's living Mm. like you know thank you so my encouragement would be like it doesn't matter whatever walk you're in like these are things that you can do so whether you're a Christian or whether you're like Buddhist or Hindu or Catholic or whatever like this is like a human thing right you know it's not like like this is for this religion like I feel like everyone can pretty much agree this is earth and this is the only place we have yeah and so we should really try to steward it well like we really we have the power to change the atmosphere we have the power to change like the culture and by that word I mean like what a general place feels like and like um, how we move through the world. Yes. Yeah. Like I obviously love like all different cultures, but I mean like the culture of the world, like let's make it a place where we really enjoy living. And like, um, I will say I went to India. Was that last summer or two summers ago? That was, that was the summer of 2018. Oh, India. Mm-hmm. you went to India January through February of 2019. Yeah. So it wasn't, the Last summer, year. but it felt yep. like it because it was so hot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I was there in their winter, but I will say before traveling to India, I thought America was actually pretty dirty just mm-hmm. cause I would see litter and like, I just thought outside, I loved dirt growing up, loved it. But I, I still was like, oh yeah. Like when you're traveling on the highway, it's not like the most glamorous thing Right. until I went to India and other countries. I was like, holy cow, America is so clean. Mm. And so I will say I love that America does do better um, with cleaning up highways and actually making good highways because they're, we are so privileged because we actually have money and funding to pour into like our roads and highways and stuff. That's never something I would have thought of before, but I would say try not to like have a bad attitude about the place that you're living. Um, Definitely see what things you can improve but like be grateful no mm-hmm. matter where you are because right. in India they live in a landfill and mm-hmm. I was astounded and like I will this is really funny I'm going to share this really funny story just so people understand that it's actually not like I think funding has a lot to do with it but it is a mindset and you need like so much of our lives begin with a thought so mm-hmm. how we live our life is basically what we believe and like yeah, it's, it's basically what you believe. Like everything starts with an idea or a thought. So when I was in India, we were doing children's ministry and we were in this slum. Mm-hmm. And so we were like tucked in behind these houses and like, how big is this table? Cause that's the space that we had to like do it. Jeez, like three like, by five. Yeah. Three by five feet. So that's where we were putting on like little plays for them Mm. and like games and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, we had little like treats for them in a wrapper. So they were like all really good boys and girls. So we were like, okay, you guys get your treat. Um, And so all the kids, of course, rip open this candy and then they eat it and they're so happy and then they all scatter. (laughs) And they're so cute and it was so fun. Um, and so at the end, I'm like bending over and I'm picking everything up with my hand because in my mind it's a value of mine to not litter I've been taught that ever since I was younger Mm -hmm. um I feel wrong if I throw something out the window that I know I shouldn't like plastic or a wrapper or whatever I feel so horrible if I do that Mm -hmm. um just because that's what I've been taught ever since I was little so I'm picking this stuff up because one I really value faithfulness so do something good when I know that maybe not everyone's watching like do do the right thing when no one's watching. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to pick this up because I know that one, I'm taking care of earth, even this small act, I'm taking care of earth. And two, I feel like I'm, I'm like filling up my own personal Mm -hmm. integrity, you Mm -hmm. know? 
So I'm picking it all up and then I'm like looking for a trash can and I'm like holding this trash <laughs> in my hand and I'm like, okay, trash can. And normally there are lots of public right. trash cans in America. There are none, none in India. Yeah. So I'm like walking around and this sweet, sweet Indian girl who was like doing ministry with us, but couldn't really speak English. Mm -hmm. Um, she was like gesturing to me and she was holding out her hands, like gesturing to me to give me all the trash because she was going to take it off my hands. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that's so sweet. And I was like, are you sure? And in that culture, it's really rude to like refuse help. Mm. So like in America would be like, no, 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 I got it. I got right. it. But I was like, okay. And so I give her my handful of trash, all these little candy wrappers, put them in her hand. And she literally, <laughs> I'm going to, I laugh. I still think of this and I just laugh. She literally took one step to the right and sprinkled, like just released uh. all the wrappers all over the sidewalk. And it was in her mind, she was really helping me. And she was like, here, let me just take all of that off your hands. Blah. And just like threw them all over the sidewalk. But it was so funny because she kind of like strategically placed them to the side right. as if that was going to matter. Like right. as if yeah. that was not going to be in someone's way. Yeah. But I literally, I just stood there and I just, my mouth just dropped. I was like, Oh <laughs> I could have done wow what is going on and I just laughed and I was like that is just the difference of how we think about yeah, it for sure and in her mind she did absolutely nothing wrong she was helping me and she was so sweet and kind and I wasn't offended or mad at all because I just realized like okay difference of culture here right right and so that's yeah. just one thing like and so take her multiply that times mm -hmm. how many people live in India. That's mm -hmm. how they think. Mm -hmm. So even the Christians there, like, I feel like the Christians there should be the ones that are like, oh, maybe we should take care of our world. But their culture is so ingrained in who they are. That's not what they think of. They're mm -hmm. just like, this is what we do. And they just throw trash on the ground. Right. Yeah. And, and definitely everything I've talked about is important to know is contextually based in American culture, obviously. But, um, but yeah, I mean, not all countries have the infrastructure to think about waste or really address it in the same way that we do. So in a lot of ways, we're blessed to live in a place where we do have the infrastructure for waste. Um, mm -hmm. And, and yeah, yeah, I think thinking about the zero waste movement on a, on a global scale completely changes the conversation, right? right. Like it's going to look completely different because you're starting at different points and, uh, and different, again, infrastructures. Um, but yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a thing. That's very <laughs> funny. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm all out of questions on mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, zero waste life, but just so that the audience gets a chance to know you, I like to do rapid fire questions at the end oh, of the okay. podcast. Okay. They have nothing to do with anything. Nice. Just <laughs> Hit me. <laughs> it's just to get to know you. <laughs> what are your, uh, top three favorite movies? If you have any. <laughs> I'm like such not a cinema person. Everyone hates me for it because they're like, why don't you watch movies? Um, I don't know. I usually say Where the Wild Things Are is one of my favorite movies. Mm. Um, but I don't really have a list. Curious I, Case of Benjamin Button. Sobbed. I sobbed at that movie. It was awful. And so now sad. that you say that, though, I'm like, wow. She was so sacrificial because all I wanted to do when I'd come over is watch movies. And oh, yeah. Probably for just sure. Like, yeah. Yeah, sure, that's fine. This is Whatever. Fine. This is great, yeah. Uh, oh, I just I just recently saw a portrait of a lady on fire, and that was incredible, so would yeah. recommend that to anyone. Um, I'll have to check that out. But yeah, not a big movie person, unfortunately. Okay. That's a bad first question for you. No worries. <laughs> what are your top three favorite books? Ooh, uh, that's a good one as well. Um, All About Love, New Visions by Bell Hooks, who's mm -hmm. one of my favorite feminist authors. Um, really anything by her, I would say, is, is in my top um, Until We Reckon by Danielle Sered um, is a book about mass incarceration and mm -hmm. restorative justice and accountability for our actions and how we heal from harm, which is incredibly life changing, would mm -hmm. recommend to anyone. Um, and then I'm trying to think of a third one that I would consider a top. Um, If you just have two, it's totally cool. Okay, we'll stick with two. Those are the two that are like most recent in my memory right now. Sweet. Um, 
These are the weirder questions. Perfect. Do you That's believe in aliens? Better. Yes or no? And yes. Why? Yeah. There's just no way that we're the only ones in the whole universe. There's yeah. just no way. What? He's so happy you just said that. Well, I, I mean, I've got my opinions, and I'm <laughs> I'm more along with that than anything else. But like, what do you think? Little green men nah. or people like us? It or... could even just be like you know, like plant life forms or something. Like I just yeah. think there is life other than us somewhere do you think we've been visited oh good question i don't know my grandma though nanny who you yeah. met laura um she used to she would keep clippings from newspapers about ufo sightings so i think that oh. might just run in my in my blood that you know i'm, I'm there's thinking something about, these about that generation that's fascinated with that my dad the ufos yeah my dad he keeps an eye on that stuff yep. too but can i sneak in my opinion Go ahead. i think we have <laughs> <laughs> gotta be gotta be um so in light of everything that's kind of going on in the world right now too, just kind of like this weird atmosphere of so many things getting turned over on their heads mm -hmm. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Are you, uh, do you believe in conspiracies or anything like that? I'm not a big conspiracy person. I think that, um, I think there's a fair amount of neg negligence in our government in general, mm -hmm. um, which you could spin into a conspiracy theory, but I don't think that we necessarily need to be coming up with like these crazy out there theories, like the problem exists and it's mm -hmm. tangible in our government. And like, I don't need someone telling me that like aliens or like some underground mob had something to do with it. Yeah, like yeah. it's right in front of our faces, people. <laughs> but have you heard about, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell getting mm -hmm. arrested and everything? You know, no. she, you know, she was Jeffrey Epstein's right hand man. Oh uh, yeah. I think I saw a Facebook what? headline about so it. So it's but... like, I've never had the opportunity to be so open and honest about like, you know, like a, like a conspiracy or something. Mm. But then it's like, you see that situation. Mm. And then of course I saw that Ghislaine Maxwell like his right hand woman uh was arrested and i'm just like the eyes of the world are on this situation yeah, right now right. because <laughs> it's like that that would be if there was something if there was a construct that would be that would be the closest thing i guess to imagine that that would be it but mm -hmm. yeah i just don't know how much time i can truly invest <laughs> in that and then like it would take a lot be completely wrong at yeah. the same time like i just wasted all that right. time but it's still really significant to me mm -hmm. um what is one of the best pieces of advice you've ever received um my mom growing up would always tell me if if you're gonna do something do it right the first time and and by that she just meant if you're going to commit to doing something put your all into it the first time you do it yeah. instead of kind of you know halfway halfway putting uh putting your effort into it so that's awesome. a mantra that I that I carry with me and, and anytime I embark on a new endeavor I'm like I'm gonna give it everything that I've got the first time instead of having to backtrack and Sweet. do it later yeah cool uh last question is there anything that you would want the audience to know about you as a person um well I was kind of thinking about this when Laura was speaking because Laura you're you just always do a beautiful job of speaking from your heart and bringing emotion and, and love and just people back into the conversation, which is really important. And, and I think that that's something I would like to, to center at the heart of this conversation is, um, again, while it's an environmental movement and it's about our impact on, on the planet, um, so much of, of why I do this and why I think we all should do this is, is just my love for people and, and recognizing the way that planet and people are so intimately interconnected and, and recognizing the way that our actions have an impact on other people. Um, and just, and just keeping that heart for people at the center of, of any social justice endeavor. I mean, when we're talking about, um, the environment, especially, but you know, anything, uh, we have so many things going on in the news and the media and the world right now. And, and at the heart of it, I just hope that people realize that like, it's about loving one another and it's about you know caring for and supporting both people and the planet and so i would just like to you know make sure that that's centered at the at the heart of all these conversations uh, so thank you laura for yeah. always Sweet. making me think i will say off of that that is such a good motivation mm -hmm. because like there are people that worship the earth and like worship trees and stuff and like personally i believe people are more important i think mm -hmm. the earth and like everything in it is beautiful and given for a purpose and like we are called to like use that well and like have that as a gift um but 
if I'm gonna like be holding a baby and like be standing next to a tree, I'm obviously gonna like pour everything I have into that baby. Mm -hmm. Um, But we do need the trees. Like they provide shade, oxygen, you know, lots of good stuff. But that's like such a good motivation because it's like not a lot of people um, can connect like the importance of like, why should I take care of earth? But they know what it feels like to love and be loved by Mm -hmm. people and like, they know what pain feels like Mm -hmm. and so i feel like that creates empathy and it's like if i can make someone else's life better by like just changing habits in my home that i feel like is a great motivation yeah so why wouldn't i i'm so glad that you said that because this isn't like oh let's just take our focus off of people and just pour into like Right. how we take care of the land right no it's like we are actually helping. we're all connected yeah mm-hmm. so i love that you just brought that up mm-hmm. sweet well mary thank you so much of course thank you for on. having me i feel like i learned a lot and like Good. there's obviously you know if somebody wants to start somewhere at trying to make the world a better place they might as well start in their home right you know? so easy place to start thank you so much for yeah coming of course on. and uh yeah everybody uh thank you for listening if you guys learned something i know i did uh i know you'll be better off for it so uh thank you and we will see you next time